Research shows that people you hang out with have a bigger effect on how your life goes than just about anything else. They influence the choices you make, they influence the standards you set for yourself, they influence the other people that you're going to meet in the future. But the weird thing is, people hardly talk about this. We talk about romance and how to date, but did anyone ever teach you how to have friends? No, it's assumed that we'll just pick it up by osmosis or from our families. If this is something your parents didn't model for you or they couldn't model for you because they were really limited or damaged in this area too, you are so not alone. <laughs> Especially for people who grew up with trauma, learning to have friends and be a friend is so tricky. Maybe you struggle to have friends or you have friends, but the relationship stays on the shallow end and you don't get close or you get close, but then your trauma symptoms can get the better of you and something happens to trigger you and the whole thing blows up big argument, little argument that you can't really recover from, or the friendship just crumbles. Has this happened to you? I'm guessing it's happened a number of times. If you grew up with abuse and neglect, there's a high probability that having friends is a part of life that gets hard for you sometimes. And this is a big reason why unhealed trauma can be so devastating to your life over time. You end up isolated. You don't have those people who love you and get you and who are there for you when you need them. And this is really important. Not having that is a big setback. And I'm sure that it's robbed you in some ways of the life that you deserve. But the good news is this can change and you can heal and the path of your life can start getting better right now if you can develop some friendship skills and learn to form friendships with good people. Now this is something I had to really work on in my life. My trauma symptoms kind of got worse over time in my early adulthood. And so good friends that I had were pulling away and I didn't know what was wrong. Now I know, now we all know it's complex PTSD and it has a common pattern of symptoms that once you know what they are, even if you haven't totally healed them yet, it can clarify what may have been going on and going wrong in your friendships and what part of these problems is something you can change. So here's what I learned. First, it's so important that you pick the right people for friends, <laughs> because if you're like a lot of people with childhood PTSD, you find that troubled people have this funny allure for you. What is it about them? It's a mystery. They feel so charmingly comfortable, so unthreatening, so much like home. And maybe you have a history of buddying up with the most troubled kid in the class or somebody who turns out to have a drug problem or people who are really not available to be good friends. So the first thing is to start identifying who would be the good, healthy people for you to hang out with. Now we talk about this a lot in my dating and relationships course and in my connection course because this broken picker problem is really common for people with childhood PTSD. But the way you choose friends can be just as rickety. Now the key to get clear with yourself is to actually write down what characteristics are absolutely essential for you. So let's say it's that people are kind, right? They're honest. They reciprocate your interest in friendship. You don't have to know these people yet, but you're defining what the right people are like, how you will recognize them. And then you also spell out what characteristics you cannot have in friends. And this might be characteristics where you had a blind spot before and you know it brings your life down. So I used to have a blind spot for people who had serious drug addictions. First, I wouldn't see it. And then I would see it, but I'd be too afraid of loneliness to say anything or stop hanging out with them. And I had no business hanging out with serious addicts. I was never into drugs myself, but that's what I grew up with and that's where I felt at home. And so I'd use kind of fuzzy reasoning to rationalize staying friends with serious addictions. And it would introduce all kinds of trouble into my life, drama, shame, people stealing my stuff. I know, right? It didn't fit with the other parts of my life where I was fairly functional. And I had to make a decision that I could not have that in my life anymore. Not with the blind spot that I personally have and the way I couldn't seem to keep boundaries at the time. So you write down what your lines are, what characteristics are a big no way for people that you let into your life. 
Okay, so that helps keep certain people out. And as you may be fearing, it's true, that setting boundaries about who can be in your life could introduce a period of loneliness. You end some friendships and the new people haven't arrived yet. You haven't found them yet. Now I know finding good, healthy people is easier said than done when you had a crappy childhood. Sometimes trauma symptoms show up that make things harder for that too. Maybe you get emotionally intense and fall apart. Friends might stand by you at first, but part of falling apart is it makes a person very inwardly focused. And in the long run, this can push friends away too. Or worse, maybe your stress comes out as a tendency to criticize and blame your friends when you're feeling overwhelmed. So there's conflict, you're hurting feelings. They don't wanna deal with that, so they pull away. Or maybe you're the one who pulls away. So these are common trauma-driven dynamics and reactions to ordinary stress that can happen in a friendship. And even if you're able to keep your feelings under control enough to not ruin everything in a big explosion, that kind of self-control can really limit the depth of a relationship. It can limit how much fun the friendship can be if you're just holding yourself together tightly all the time. There's not the deep connection and trust between you and your friend that would be needed for a friendship to last. And so over time, being too controlled will cause a friendship to fade too. And it's a sad and hard part of trauma healing that this, this part can be so hard to change but you can change these dynamics by working on yourself. So one of the first things you can do to have great relationships is just pick good people and then work over time to be a good friend. When you wanna hang out with somebody, I would suggest, if it's at all awkward, invite them to do something with you. So not just random hanging out, but an activity. With good friends, it's normal to get together without a plan or without an activity. And that's really good with somebody you're already close with where there's no need to have a plan. But if you're just getting to know somebody, doing some activity can kind of take the focus off the interpersonal dynamics so much. You know, a little is good, but a lot can be overwhelming. Now, one of my favorite examples, I always say this, bowling, right? The bowling alley near me closed during the pandemic. I hate that. If you go to a movie with somebody, right, you can't talk. If you go to a restaurant, you have to talk the whole time. But if you go bowling, you can kind of talk, bowl, talk, bowl. And if things get weird or you need a breather, you can just really focus on the bowling for a little while and then come back to the conversation. So doing things helps. The next thing is about being a good listener. Now, everybody knows this, but try this, okay? When you get together with your friend, spend 30 minutes just doing an experiment. Only listen to them. Don't talk about yourself and instead focus on listening and responding to what they're saying about themselves. Now, I'm not saying do this forever, but just as an experiment and as practice, just listen to the other person and reflect on what they're saying and give them feedback. Now, it may feel really uncomfortable to not talk about yourself at all, right? Um, because what's normal, what people do often is you say, hey, this thing happened to me. And it's normal for somebody else to say, oh, that happens to you? Me too. One time, you know, and then you tell a story about how it happened to you. So it's natural to relate information about yourself when someone tells you something about themselves. That's the way many of us think that we're being a good friend. And sometimes it is, but when it goes too far, it can make the other person feel interrupted and deflated about something they were trying to be heard about. So it's good to really, you know, hear what someone's trying to say, to really hear it. So when they tell you about something that happened, you can go, wow, what was that like for you? And then what happened? It, right? And, uh, well, uh, wow, that's, that's weird. You, you, you listen to what they're saying and respond to what they're saying. Don't relate it to yourself. That's how you can get closer to a person. 30 minutes, just try not talking about yourself. Okay. It will teach you a lot. So this one time, my husband and I went to a party where we didn't really know people and we were kind of anxious about the party because we both would prefer to be at a party where we know somebody. So just as a strategy to make the evening fun, we decided to do the experiment and we made a rule for the whole evening, just a secret rule. We didn't tell anybody we were doing it. For the whole party, we only listened and talked about what other people were saying. We never ever talked about ourselves. And it was funny, we were so popular. We got invited by two other couples to have dinner sometimes. And honestly, that rarely happens, you know, when we meet people. 
They didn't know anything about us. <laughs> and here's the funny thing. They never asked a single thing about us, right? See, they weren't great listeners either. And it, it didn't feel great to never be asked, but it really like raised my awareness about, wow, you know, that is not what's going on in a conversation with a lot of people. Some are really great at it. So anyway, we never actually ended up having dinner with anybody, but it was a really good lesson for me that y you can just listen and you can actually learn a lot about people. It reminds me um, when I used to, I, uh, I used to have this work that involved a lot of travel and a bunch of us would travel to other cities and do a consulting job and then travel somewhere else. And a lot of times people got together and had wine at dinner. And at a certain phase of my life, I decided I just didn't want to drink alcohol anymore. And for like eight years, I didn't drink any alcohol. And um, it was so interesting because when you sit together and you don't drink alcohol with people who are just having some wine with dinner, like they, they get very open about stuff. And, um, and I was just very aware of myself. And it was a little bit of a contact high to be around people who were having a glass or two of wine. So I felt relaxed. I felt like myself, but I wasn't accidentally self-disclosing a bunch of stuff, which is what, especially back at that time of my life, was likely to have happened. And the other thing I liked about it is that, like, if I would go to the ladies' room at 10 o'clock at night and go to the mirror to wash my hands, I'd look in the mirror and my face was still fresh. It wasn't all like red with running mascara. It was a nice little thing. So, you know, not drinking wine and doing a really good job of listening is a way to really show up with other people with all your faculties. And I'm not saying you have to be so perfect all the time that you're just with your faculties all the time. Sometimes you get to relax. But I am saying if you struggle to make friends, anything you can do to heighten your awareness of what the dynamic is and just pay attention to what your natural inclinations are, what's hard for you, what other people are like. Like I was really surprised. I thought that these other people at the party were people that we had to impress. But the fact that they never asked about us and talked about themselves, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know. It just wasn't that impressive. It was okay. You know, it just wasn't that impressive though. So I learned a lot of people are not good listeners, but just about everyone is hungry to be listened to. So here's another thing to keep in mind. And it's another form of good listening is don't give unsolicited advice. If somebody says, oh, I had a hard day yesterday, I had a headache all day, you don't have to jump in and tell them what you do about a headache and go, oh, you know what you have to do? They're not really telling you about the headache unless people specifically ask for advice. Hey, what would you do if you had a headache? It's, you know, it's just better to listen and hear what it is they really wanted you to hear, which is that they had a hard day. It was so hard, they had a headache the whole time. And then you can say, wow, that sounds like a hard day. What did you do? That's how a friend listens. So similar to that, you can give them affirmation. You can give them a word of praise, recognizing something good about them, a compliment. People like to be appreciated more than you might think. And obviously you shouldn't do it too much. It, you know, at a certain point it becomes manipulative of other people and that's not good. But when you can give a sincere compliment, make it a clean compliment. Don't say, oh gosh, your blouse is so pretty. Mine is so ugly though, but I love yours. That's not a clean compliment. That's kind of like loaded, right? You're putting them on the spot to say something about your blouse. No, yours is very nice. A clean compliment is when you go, you know, that shirt you're wearing just looks great. It's a really good color for you. That's it. And you just make it clean, nice, clean compliment. And people like it and it boosts their spirits. They need encouragement and they like it when their accomplishments and the good things about them are noticed. That's just a good friend thing to do, is to notice and encourage what is good in another person. Now, here's another good listening thing. When your friend has told you about a big thing they're expecting, maybe they're giving a speech at an event next week, or they're, they have a final, or they tell you about something that was hard, like they recently had shoulder surgery, a good friend follows up on that, maybe calls them a few days later and says, hey, I was just checking in, how'd the speech go? Or how's your shoulder doing today? If you think about it, people who do that for you, those are the people who you end up closest with. That's like showing up for people and actually paying attention, not just in the moment, in the conversation, but over time. That's what a good friend is who, you know, you, it's not just small talk. It's, it's, it's connection. It's, it's a durable connection between you. That's what a good friend is. If you want to have a friend, you've got to be a friend. And if you want to have a good friend, you've got to be a good friend. Now, another thing is to be a believer in your friend. Everybody has self-doubt. 
And when we become friends with people, we'll begin to reveal what those doubts are. And they might be something like, well, you know, I'm thinking about changing jobs, but I think I might be kidding myself that anyone would ever hire me. So you know what a good friend is? It's someone who sees your very best potential and believes in you and can express that to you and remind you of your strengths and why you are employable and supports you in finding ways to make that happen. That's how to be a believer in your friend. And I think a lot of people, we tend to think that if we don't put somebody down, then we're not causing any harm. But actually, people need to have a witness that they're doing something right and that there's potential for them to do something even better. So good friends can believe in the best possible outcome and always encourage a friend toward that next step. A good friend also shows up for the hard stuff. And that means picking people up from the airport, visiting them in the hospital, helping them move their furniture, and sitting with them when they're grieving, when they've lost a loved one. I know that when there was a period in my life where I had a lot of tragedy, I really found out who my friends were. A lot of people who I thought were good friends, they disappeared. They didn't help. They didn't even call or they said, let me know if there's anything I can do, or I don't know what to say. <laughs> you don't even know what you need when you're in that state. So A, when people say, you know, if there's anything I can do, you'll notice nothing really follows up. And that's kind of baked into that comment of like, let me know if there's anything I can do. There are special people who know how to ask if you need help. They know what to say. They suggest a thing or two. They say, would it help if I picked up some groceries on my way over? And would it be okay if I wash these dishes right now? It was the people who did that for me, who took the time to come see me in the hospital, even though it was far away and so boring and creepy and hard to park. And they are the people who made a huge difference in my life right when I was the most depressed. And they encouraged me and took me for walks around the corridors. In the long run, those are the people who became the lifelong friends. It's a beautiful thing to do for other people. So you want to show up for the good times, the weddings, the parties, the celebrations, but you also want to show up for the hard stuff. And a good friend shows up for the good and the bad. You never want to talk behind your friend's back. That's important. I'm just going to say this. You don't really want to say anything bad about anyone who's not present, but especially your friends. Don't ever talk about them behind their back. I mean, even if you know for a fact they're never going to know, just on the off chance that the energy reaches them. You know, our nervous systems are connected and we can feel these things in each other. You know, if somebody says, no, I'm not mad, you can feel when they're mad, right? We're connected. And the people we love, especially, you know, can feel that. So you don't want to talk about your friends behind their back have their back, protect their identity, protect who they are, protect their hearts. And finally, stay in touch with them. This is one of the terrible things about contemporary times is that we think, well, I said hello on Instagram and I texted happy birthday or I stuck it on Facebook. But if you're not talking to people face to face or at least on the telephone, it's really hard to sustain a close friendship. Messaging on social media, it's not nothing, but for those purposes, it just doesn't count. So whenever you can, go see people face to face. If you can't see them face to face, talk on the phone or video chat. If you can't talk on the phone, send an email. And if you can't send an email, send a text. And if you can't do that, okay, fine. Talk to them on social media. If I, I do all those things for people, they don't do it for me, then go back to the beginning of the video where I said the first thing is how you choose people. It's all about how you choose your friends. So these are some of the ways that you can be a better friend. One really hard but ultimately positive part of healing your past trauma is when the friends who used to be a great match for you just don't fit anymore because you're changing. Now some people don't want you to change and some are okay with it, but the way that they're dysfunctional will gradually start to be more visible to you as you heal your own dysfunction. And it's easy to think on any given day that, you know, you're all healed now. And maybe even you would look down on people who are still stuck in their trauma driven behaviors. It's okay to set your boundaries on behaviors you don't want in your life anymore. But I want to show you a middle ground between codependently hanging out with people who are still dysfunctional, even though they drag you down. And on the other hand, treating them like they're, you know, evil or, you know, treating them with contempt. There's a place for them in your life, but with boundaries. So this often happens when people have begun to emerge from trauma-driven living, but they haven't yet learned to set boundaries. 
totally normal phase of healing. So my letter today is from someone I'll call Riley and she writes, hello, Anna. Thank you for all you do for so many people. I just broke off a four year friendship with a friend who goes into a rage. I ended contact with her two years ago and resumed contact with her a year ago, assuming that we both had grown in our recovery. All right. I'm circling things with the my pink pencil here today, and I'm going to come back to some of this. Let's just read through Riley's letter and I can see what's going on and then see if I can help. What precipitated the final breakup was her raging at me and cursing at me because I had refused to pay the valet for her car. She threatened to make me get out of her car and cursed at me. I knew there was no point in arguing with her in the state she was in, so I sat silently along the way, said a terse goodbye, then got out, got into my car, and left. I texted her that night to tell her that I wanted to end the relationship and then blocked her phone number. We still have a recovery meeting in common. At this point, I want nothing to do with her. I want nothing else to do with her. If I were to see her at the meeting, I don't even want to acknowledge her presence, not to punish her, but to show myself enough respect that I decide who has a place in my life. Would you say hello to such a person? I won't leave that meeting as I have a leadership role and a sponsee with whom I support, but I don't feel any need to engage with this former friend, either verbally or via technology. Please offer your thoughts if you're willing. Thank you, Riley. All right, I love that you have a recovery meeting that you go to. That's really positive. So I want to tell you something based on my experience. I know how it is when you are actively working on your healing, which you are, um, you are going to go through changes. But when you're in a recovery meeting, by its nature, everyone in that meeting has problems. So I think there's this expectation sometimes when people get into a 12 step program or something, they go, Oh my gosh, you know, um, uh, there was this guy, he hit on me. What a terrible program. Hey, you know, people go to the, they go to these meetings because they are struggling. So a person needs to have boundaries at meetings. And often when you first get there, you don't have boundaries and you don't have a red flag detector. So I see what happened here. You got there and in your earlier phase of recovery, you became friends with somebody who would rage at you. And probably there's something in your past and your programming that made you think, oh, that's okay. I can put up with raging. And you just got to a point in your healing when you're like, no, I cannot put up with people raging at me. I don't want to do it anymore. And you set a boundary. So that's good. You got out of the car. You ended the relationship. Great. So here's the thing, you are seeing each other in meetings now, and you even have somebody you sponsor who is seeing how you act. So I don't know about you, but there's a pretty big emphasis in, in 12 step recovery on dealing with resentment. So when you, um, continue to see a friend who really made you angry, you didn't like how she treated you. It doesn't really have anything to do with respect. I get that it feels like self-respect to give her the silent treatment, but the silent treatment, I, there's a, there's a middle ground here. Let me just tell you what it is. I've had plenty of people, you know, burn me and I've had, I, there was somebody I sponsored once who just, she spread all these like nasty rumors about me. It affected my reputation with people. I was really offended. I ran into her not that long ago and she's like, Hey, how's it going? And I was just like, it's going all right. And, um, I heard that she told people that we were all patched up and it's not patched up. She never acknowledged what she did. And, uh, it, you know, it's still, I still feel like, Ooh, danger person, you know, don't let this person into your life, but I'm totally polite. I'm totally polite to everybody I see in a meeting because a meeting is a place where everybody needs to be there for their healing. And if anybody has made it that far, they just kind of deserve a little bubble of, um, decency. Now that doesn't, a boundary doesn't mean you have to give the silent treatment. That's not a boundary. A boundary is you don't hang out with them. You don't maybe talk about personal things, but I see no reason you can't go hello when you walk in and leave, not to be a big drama show. You know, you don't want to bring drama into a meeting. You don't want to um, model behavior that you punish people who are in a 12 step meeting because, because they still have very, very common symptoms of things that go along with 12 step problems. I don't know what your fellowship is here, but whether it's AA or Al-Anon or something, yeah, people fly into a rage. That's why they're there. So I encourage you 
to focus on your recovery, work with your sponsor to deal with your resentment about this and with your sense that you don't have adequate ways of protecting yourself from treatment like this. You do. You have your awakened mind so that you don't get into friendships like that anymore. You don't have to anymore. And sometimes, you know, it, it happens. It's so normal. But that is one of the things that characterizes friendships. Um, it's a terrific thing. I know when I got into recovery, I was so grateful to have a group full of people and instant friends and people I could hang out with. And I went through these growing pains where, you know, sometimes people, they were, they would be really nice. And then all of a sudden they would blow up or they, or they would, um, I don't know, just be gossipy or blamey. It didn't happen very often. I mean, the ratio of like difficulty with people compared to all the great things I got out of it was small. But I remember my sponsor told me, it's like, hey, this is 12-step recovery. <laughs> this is why people come. And I guess I had had this, I had a fantasy. I had this idealization that everybody there was all, all recovered now and they had scooped me up. But actually, you know, within a not that long amount of a time, I became one of the people who was supporting other people and I always always tried to be polite and you know civil to everybody <sighs> weird stuff happens right I had somebody in a meeting once she was she came in and was very disruptive she started interrupting everything that was said and you know demanding that she have the floor for all this resentment she had and I spoke up and I said hey you have to raise your hand like everybody else and a lot of people were really angry that I said that but that's what I thought was the right thing. You know, you don't get to just go in and start interrupting the whole thing and somebody will speak up with you. That's just sane. So just as an example, boundaries, you're allowed to have boundaries. You're allowed to tell people to stop. You're allowed to get out of the car. You're allowed to block contact. But I just would not give the silent treatment in the context of a recovery meeting. You don't need to. Um, if you are fearful that that gives her the idea that she can come and attack you, it's not so. You have a boundary. And I think what you said is, I won't leave the meeting, but I don't feel the need to engage. Oh, that's what it is. Um, I, I want, I don't want to acknowledge her presence, not to punish her. I'm sorry. It is punishment. It is. But to show myself enough respect that I decide who has a place in my life. I want you to respect yourself and I want you to decide who has a place in your life. And n giving somebody the silent treatment changes nothing about your difficulty with those boundaries. Your continued recovery always is going to depend on facing and getting free from um, this, the resentful ways that you've tried to protect yourself from difficult people. You're just like us, you know, you're just like everybody. It's normal, but as you recover, terrible treatment, silent treatment, it, that sort of thing, it's, um, it's not necessary for you to have boundaries. If you didn't get cared for properly when you were little, it's hard to read other people when they actually like you and there's potential for real friendship versus when they're just being friendly, but the connection between you isn't going to stand the test of time. And what also complicates making new friends is that so many of us need a friend so badly that there's pressure on the relationship from the get-go. Old childhood wounds sneak out and make it feel urgent that you connect, that the friendship happen. And when it doesn't, it can feel devastating. So how do you know when someone is really interested in friendship? And how can you get to know them in a way that gradually lets you observe what they're actually like? Do they get you or is it superficial? Do they belong in your life or are they just using you as a time filler or as a stepping stone to some other friends? And when you feel weird and bad with them, is it just you or is it not a fit? My letter today is from a woman I'll call Mira and she writes, Dear Fairy, I recently had a situation with two newer friendships. I've got the fairy pencil. I'm going to circle things that stand out to me in this letter I want to come back to, but let's do a whole read on Mira's letter and see if I can help. All right. She says, of these two newer friendships, one I ha hung out with one-on-one, -on -one, and she seemed very interested in me, and we would, could have deeper conversations. She kept asking questions about things I was doing. I thought it was out of conversation, but soon I could see she was kind of copying me. I started teaching a yoga class at a popular spot, and she asked me about it and attended my class and said she wanted to make it part of her routine. We're both new to the city and she hadn't made any other friends yet. She was telling me she wanted to lead some kind of discussions at her house or somewhere because she's a quote life coach. 
Well, before I know it, she's having them at the same place I am and used the connection with me to get it. In her many Facebook vlogs, I noticed she mentioned once, if you don't want to do yoga like everybody else, you don't have to. And it seemed like a jab at me because that's what I was doing, but I let it go. Then I introduced her to some new friends and she seemed eager to make friends. I noticed she kept asking me to invite other people. I then started working outdoors with a newer friend and mentioned it to this girl and she immediately jumped on it. She's not even a morning person and the workouts are super early and far for her, so it was strange that she would join. Then I saw she'd just focus her attention on this other friend, almost as if I wasn't there. I was really annoyed. She'd also post in our group chat, asking to go to events on days that I was teaching my class, which felt weird. Then as soon as she had something else to do, she didn't come to my class. She didn't have to, but why say you will come? Then she invited everyone I introduced her to dinner, which felt weird. No one was there that I hadn't introduced her to. I heard this term friend poaching, and this is what I think she was doing. Anyway, I didn't want to, but I ended up inviting her to a weekend getaway because I felt she'd feel left out. This other girl and I had planned it. She jumped on that too, even though it was last minute. The whole time it seemed like she just focused her attention on getting close to the other girl, and I felt left out. I admit I often do, which could be part of my PTSD, but there I was feeling a competition vibe from this girl. I had a horrible time and even said at one point where they did something without me and they apologized, but still the same vibe was there. I felt left out and I didn't interact much, which was a CPTSD response, but it was too much for me to deal with. I was so dysregulated. After the trip, I stopped going to the workouts. I started with the other girl and the needy one posted pictures of them working out and how she is the best workout buddy. She's also posting constantly on Facebook and making this image of how close she is to the other girl, but she barely knows her. It's very off-putting to me, but now I'm the odd one out. It strikes me as weird and needy behavior, and she's a life coach. <laughs> I also got her a client before. I knew she was like this, but when sharing it with others, she didn't credit me. Did I totally misread this person? How do I know when my CPTSD is triggered and when to trust my judgment? How do I assess good friends and develop good friendships? I want to have a better friendship, but find them tough. It's hard to trust and I find I'm, t I'm often too open and then have to close up because I see they aren't that good. I'm constantly second guessing myself and my perception. I'd love your perspective. Thank you. Okay, Mira. You know, I love this letter because your dilemma is like a perfect dilemma. You could do one reading of your situation and you're being ridiculous. You know, she's just making friends. What's the big deal? She's trying to build her yoga practice. There's this other read on it that I can see very well also because I've had this happen to me too. And I think other people thought I was being unreasonable, but it went on for years and I felt really ripped off. I felt that somebody had really used my friendships and social connections and social gatherings and things to develop their own thing and then <laughs> never um, acknowledged me, befriended me, included me. And after a while, it was sort of a hopeless mess and it started to taint my feelings towards other people. I'll tell you how I resolved that, how I became happy and free of that whole thing in a minute, but let's go through. So you were saying this person was kind of copying you. Okay, um, yeah, you could, you could think, you know, let's do, okay, let me put on the hat where I'm like, Mira, you're being crazy. This is nothing. Copying you, they just have things in common. And um, she wanted to lead discussions, and then she used the place that she found out that where you were teaching already. Okay, well, it is hard to find a good venue, and she liked that venue, so she thought she'd do that. And then in her video, she said, if you don't want to do yoga like other people, you don't have to. Well, what could be more common sense than that? Why did you take it personally? Why did you think it was you? Now, again, Mira, I'm just, I'm just being the voice of like, this is silly. Why are you being so petty? Because I do understand the other side. So then um, you introduced her to some friends and because she really wanted to meet friends, she kept asking you to invite other people. Well, how friendly, you know, what a good idea. Maybe she's somebody, she's a social catalyst. She gets somebody like you to sort of 
participate and create more social gatherings. And everybody needs that, right? People are so lonely that we've been isolated for a long time. So then you notice that a new friend was going to her thing and it was odd because this other friend normally wouldn't go to an early morning thing and it was far away. And many things like that. Your friend stopped coming to your class anytime she had something better to do. But hey, Mira, right? I mean, she has a life. What do you care whether she comes? And then you heard the friend, the term friend poaching. Well, you don't own people, do you? <laughs> anyway, you say, you invited her to a weekend getaway because you didn't want her to feel left out. You wanted to leave her out, right? <laughs> but you didn't want her to feel left out. That's so kind of you. And another girl and you had planned it and she came and the whole time she just seemed like she was trying to get to know the other girl. And it was your friend and somehow your, you felt like your alliance was getting ripped apart. Well, come on, didn't you want people to get together? Then these two friends start showing up on Facebook, how buddy buddy they are. And you couldn't believe it because you know, this person is a life coach and life coaches are supposed to be better than that. But I'll tell you a secret about life coaches. And I guess technically I'm one, I rarely coach anymore. But, but the secret is everybody's just a person. Even licensed therapists are just people who, everybody's bound by common ethics and people with a license are bound by legal, legally binding ethics, but everybody's capable of being a jerk. We've experienced that, right? So then you, before you knew that she was weird and something was off, you refer to client and she didn't credit you. Well, I don't even know if that's common. Wouldn't that be a violation of privacy for a client? I don't know, crediting you. So there's me, Mira, just being the voice that you undoubtedly have in part of your head, just going, I'm being silly. Why don't I just get over myself? Here's what I think. The whole thing just feels bad. You made a friend and time and time again, it didn't feel good. You felt this weird feeling that you were sort of, you know, she was shoving past you to get to your friends out of some vision she wanted to have clients, friends, a life. So I would just say, because her line of business is stuff like yoga and coaching or you know whatever everybody does, it is important to network with people. And some people, they network at the expense of the very real organic relationships through which that sort of networking happens. If she left you feeling weird and bad about the interaction, she's not a very good networker. And I would say that tendency is likely to leave her clients feeling bad down the road, that she has an insensitivity or a um, tone deafness to how you're supposed to act around that. She's motivated by her own you know, agenda. And so I don't knock people having their own agenda. The hard part, and I say this as somebody like, I have my own business too, and my business depends very much on relationships with people. It never works to treat people badly along the way. Sometimes I have to set boundaries against people who are abusive or, you know, dishonest. Sometimes, rarely, mostly, even when I realize that a working relationship or a friendship can't work for me, there's no reason to slam the door on the way out. You know, just being kind, leaving things on good terms is always a good idea. So I'm really sorry this happened to you. I think you wouldn't be watching my channel if you didn't have a background of trauma and trauma just does this it makes it hard to read other people so i'm just here to give you a reality check if it feels bad to you it feels bad to you and i think the one way that we can get in trouble when we're trying to draw a boundary against this feeling that we get from people against people who treat us in a way that leaves a bad taste you know just that leaves a stink <laughs> in the air right it just doesn't feel good you can't always put your finger on it but that's how it feels is go ahead and step back and you don't have to make a pronouncement to her how terrible she is because technically when i read the other side of the letter like technically she's done nothing wrong it's just that you're not interested anymore it doesn't feel good so you you literally don't have to tell her you know your criticisms of her you can just stop calling her and fade out from the interactions and i know some people in the comments will be like no let her have it and tell her and that's always an option too sometimes in healing if you've never had the opportunity to be straight with somebody about how you feel it can feel good to do it i also think if she asks you if she's like why don't you ever call me anymore what's going on but the greatest thing you can do is when and if you do decide to talk about what happened with her and why you pulled away and didn't feel good about it 
you can do it without resentment or fear about what's happening and it will come out very powerfully and clearly in a way that possibly she could hear and how you get to that point is by taking the resentful and fearful thoughts into a practice where you can keep rinsing them off what's left is your clear and honest communication not a bunch of like leftover baggage from what happened in childhood and once i had this friend and you know my parents used to invalidate me all that stuff is more than anybody can possibly take responsibility for so it clutters up their ability to hear what it is you would prefer they do take responsibility for which they usually don't i'm just giving you a heads up you can tell her how you feel it doesn't she doesn't sound like somebody who would be open to that but you would be doing her a service if gently kindly without a bunch of other issues kind of mixed in there you could just tell her what it was um, but if she doesn't ask i wouldn't do it most people really can't they're not in a place where they can hear that and hearing criticisms of them like that when they're not actually asking for it can trigger backlash and then they say things to hurt you then you're dysregulated for three days and who does that serve so in short i'm saying you have choices about how you want to deal with this but stay with yourself stand by yourself honor the gut feeling you have that this yeah you know she's she's she doesn't care about you and she cares about her and i don't mean to paint her as a bad person she just doesn't have that capacity that's not where she's coming from and you can just step away from such people you don't even have to condemn them smear them anything like that just step away save your emotional energy for the really cool people who do show up in your life and then gradually become friends i think becoming friends with people if this type of thing happen has happened to you it's very similar to what i recommend in a dating situation which is go slowly, have some coffee, talk about things, let information come to you about who they are, what they're like. Notice, do they get in touch again later? Or do you always have to do the calling? Or do they hound you? Do they, you know, hunt you down? Are they always saying, hey, can you get more friends at the party? So you get to pay attention and you get to keep doing a gut check. How do you feel about it? Now, if you're using a tool like the daily practice, where you're sort of facing your emotional reaction to things a couple times a day and just kind of processing it, letting it go downstream, you will learn so much about the nature of reality. You'll start to be able to perceive, perhaps for the first time in your life, what's really happening between you and another person. I can't recommend it enough. For people who were traumatized as kids, those Hallmark card sentiments all over Facebook about how very dear a good friend is, it can be like an arrow through your heart. And it's really normal with CPTSD to struggle with friendships. Maybe you haven't yet had a genuinely close friend who gets you and stands by you through thick and thin, or you have friends and you do things together, but you've never really felt like you could be yourself. like like you were safe with them. And you don't know if it's because you chose the wrong friends or if somehow it's you. It's hard to face, but it's possible that your trauma-driven behaviors are part of why things aren't working with friends. And today might be the day, if you're ready to take a gentle look at this in the video I'm about to share with you, this could be the day that you begin to heal. One of the biggest reasons why people who grew up with trauma struggle to maintain good relationships is because of our own behaviors. Whether we want them to or not, we do things that push people away. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people how to heal from the effects of abuse and neglect in childhood. I teach a lot about triggers, the way people and experiences can just totally dysregulate us and throw us off, neurologically, physically, and emotionally. Now triggers are important, but what's also important are the ways that we act when we're feeling triggered or when we're triggered and don't even realize it. And we end up hurting or alienating other people. And this makes me so sad. It's why so many of us have suffered so much loss. And we've often gone through our lives longing for connection and not finding it or alone and scared to even try anymore. And I'm here to say there is so much healing possible and I can show you how. Because if you want to change any negative pattern, everything depends on your ability to see and change to find the little spots where you have some power to change how your life turns out. And this can happen when you lovingly, courageously shift your focus from what happened to you to how you're handling life right now when you have a choice in the question of what happens next. Okay. Behavior number one that can push people away, 
our loneliness gets leaky. Loneliness is like the number one symptom of early trauma. And sometimes it spills out into the way that we relate to other people. And it makes us seem, I hate this word, but needy. Some ways that this can show up when we're first getting to know someone, we dominate the interaction with our stories and our feelings. So for a friendship to blossom, there's got to be some give and take, talking, listening, talking, listening, caring about the other person and being genuinely interested in them. Here's another thing our loneliness makes us do. We sometimes confuse being open with other people with just, you know, spilling our pain. Have you done that? If you're just getting to know someone and you're bringing out all your trauma stories, and let's face it, we have lots of trauma stories and they've kind of crowded out a lot of the other possible stories we could be telling. But if you're talking about that stuff, as soon as you meet someone, you might want to catch yourself and decide to just pull back and set aside the sad stuff and then measure it out in little increments over time. It's totally important to share this part of ourselves with people close to us, but unless it's an established relationship with someone who cares about the totality of you, you run the risk of overwhelming people or freaking them out. <laughs> I know I did. And then they close their hearts to you. It's just too much. Now, one exception to that is when you're talking to people who are very traumatized themselves or who are in an altered state from drugs or alcohol or who don't care what state you're in because they're trying to get something from you. So pouring your heart out in that situation might lead to a connection of a sort, but this is exactly how we so often end up entangled with inappropriate or destructive people. We get very intense. The people who can handle it are the very people who are not good for us to be around. So be measured. Little bits of your story shared over a slow time frame will help you start to build authentic friendships. Now, you might also be leaking your loneliness when you do too much of the initiating of get togethers. You call them, you text them, you've got fun ideas they might enjoy, but it's always you doing the asking. Now, if you know someone who's been depressed and wants a little encouragement, there's no problem with doing this. But in an equal relationship where no one's trying to help the other person, it's better to allow for reciprocity. You invite them to get together, then wait for them to invite you. Maybe they'll happily surprise you and be right there with an invitation very soon after the last time you got together. Or maybe you won't hear from them for a while. When people don't make an effort to get together, that is information. It's good for you to know about what kind of a friendship they're interested in and what you can expect. Like, maybe not much of a friendship in that case, and definitely not a romantic relationship. So when one person doesn't pan out into a reciprocal friendship, it's just time to meet some extra people, some new people, not to keep pushing invitations on the same person. Okay, second behavior that pushes people away. We get overly other focused. Do you know what I mean? We get very wrapped up in what the other person is thinking and feeling at the expense of what we are thinking and feeling. And this is one of those things where it always feels like no one should be able to tell that you're doing it because, hey, you're trying to be a good friend, right? But think about when people have done this to you, asking, how are you doing? Trying to read your mind, trying to fix problems that aren't even there. They're always kind of like pecking at you with this. It feels yucky, right? This is a classic fawning behavior. That's one of the major expressions of CPTSD, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And with fawning, it's like our whole beings get taken over by trying to read another person. And yes, this was a survival tool for a lot of us when we were little and trying to gauge our own safety in unsafe situations. But now the mode of behavior completely kills genuine connection. It's a form of being in our own heads, of not being present, of giving all our power to someone who has not even asked for our power. The relationships you want never require that you shut down or mentally flee the situation or give them all your power. And this is similar to another thing some of us do. When we feel rejected and hurt, but aggressively covered up by being cheerful, helpful, agreeable, no problem, this is what people who were abused as kids get way too good at. I call it crap fit. And I'll share a video with you about that at the end of this one. But going right into people pleasing when you're attacked, that's what it is. 
If someone's not treating you well, you can say something or you don't have to. And of course, you can always leave. But if some old hurt part of you responds to mistreatment by jumping in and doing a song and dance to show that, hey, you're not hurt, you're fine, you're cool, is there anything you can do? This is not connection. This is you playing a role. And if this is familiar to you, ask yourself if that's something that you're doing with any people in your life right now. Real friendships never require taking crap or abandoning yourself as a means to cope. Real friendships are made of you being present. You are present. That presence is one of the most remarkable things that begins to show up. I love watching that with the people in my programs. So many positive changes flow from there. Okay, the third behavior that pushes people away, it's having a lack of clarity about when it's just you meaning you have trouble accurately seeing your own role in problems, either blaming yourself too much or denying any responsibility, or in fact, the thought that you play any role just like makes you angry. Have you dealt with people like that? Either way, black and white thinking, I'm totally responsible, I'm never responsible, it's a way of checking out of reality. And people who are not in reality are very hard to connect with. So some signs that you might be doing this include you apologize too much. Have you ever had someone do that to you? But for something they only imagine had offended you and you're saying, please, you don't need to apologize. But they keep doing it and they keep doing it and they feel so ashamed. And it's not a good feeling to be either person in that. So if you're profusely apologizing all the time, and key indicator here is that the other person keeps insisting that you don't need to or seems uncomfortable, let it go. Just let it go. The same goes for putting yourself down, saying, oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. I look awful. I don't even belong here. You don't mean it this way, but it can come off like, like you're begging for something. What's really going on is you're drowning in fear, of course, and healing this. That's what I teach in all my courses. But telling everyone the contents of this like trash can in your mind, it just can be off-putting. Now, sometimes people who already have a trusting relationship might confess to each other the doubts they have about themselves. But blurting your fears out every time you make a mistake is consciously or unconsciously, it's an attempt to get other people to make you feel less fearful. They probably would help you if they could, but they can't. So it just makes things awkward. Now on the other side of the, is it just me syndrome are behaviors where we're oblivious to the fact when something really is our fault, which happens, right? And this shows up when someone says they're bothered by something we did and we skip over hearing it or caring how they feel and go right into defensiveness or even blaming them. Everybody knows what this feels like and absolutely no one likes it. Now it's true that sometimes people are gonna blame you unfairly for a problem, but the thing about having CPTSD is our judgment can be a bit slow or off, so it pays to listen. Now I'm not talking about listening to abusers here. That's a whole different thing when someone gaslights you or attacks you for imagined offenses and they can't be reasoned with. Those are not friends, okay? We get really fuzzy on determining, is this person's criticism right now something that I need to hear and take seriously? And the answer is, as a rule, yes. If you like and respect someone, it's only fair to hear what they have to say. Now, healing our childhood PTSD involves a balancing act between being open to hear things like criticism, but not instantly taking it inside our innermost heart and making it our truth. There's this place I call a front porch in our emotional world where we can listen and consider what we're hearing and take a moment to decide if we're going to let that inside our emotional home, our place of truth. Listening on the porch allows us to respond and responding it's not the same as reacting, is it? Reacting is how we end up lashing out and running away from people. Responding means considering another person's feelings, showing courtesy even when you don't see truth in what they're saying, not yet anyway, and making an effort to understand the spirit of what they're saying and responding to that. You don't have to fawn and grovel and you don't have to annihilate them. You can say, wow, I, I didn't realize you felt that way. Let me think about that and see if I can improve on that. Now notice all you said was that you'd think about it, that you'd see if you could improve. You didn't invalidate them. You didn't collapse emotionally, right? Sometimes during considerations, it's magical. The right words just come to you. So you can be real and tell the truth and still be a caring friend. Those two things, truth and caring, that's what allows friendships to deepen. 
And that's how healing works. Little changes made over time. So don't give up. With small steps in your overall healing, you can learn to connect better. Better connecting, it's like jet fuel for your overall healing. So it's this positive cycle that just keeps getting better. One thing leads to another. Sounds good, doesn't it?